Hey, this is John Buck, back with another Array Signal Processing video. This is actually video two in this series on the generalized side lobe canceling interpretation of the MVDR beamformer, Capon's Minimum Variance Distortionless Response Beamformer. So I assume in this video you've already, you've just watched the video on finding the inverse of the spatial covariance matrix for the single interferer case. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to go on and, and talk about once we plug that expression in for the array weight vector, what do we find? So if you haven't watched that video, stop this one, go back and watch the first, and first video in the series, and then come back and uh, come back to this video for the exciting conclusion for the finding the weight vector W0. So again, W0, W optimal for the array weight vector is this scaling term alpha, this gain term alpha, times Sn inverse V0, where alpha is just a convenient shorthand for this, and, and not to get too hung up on it, to remind us that this is just the unity gain term uh, and not an important part of the actual beam forming operation. Um, and we just found in the previous video for a single interferer, we want to think about the single interferer case, right? Always think about the simplest case to build intuition before we go on to more complicated ones. We found that we could use the Woodbury matrix inversion identity to get something that looked like this to say this inverse matrix is pretty close to an orthogonal projection matrix that we saw earlier when we talked about projection matrices. If this beta were one, this would be exactly a, a, a projection matrix. So it's not quite a projection or orthogonal projection matrix, but it, it might be close depending on what n and i and r are in the equation. And so what we're going to do in this video is we're going to take this and plug it in here and then try to uh, simplify some things to get to the array weights. So if we do that, we'll say that the W0, the array weights, are alpha times sigma n to the minus 2, i minus beta times v1, v1 Hermitian over, uh, oh, and I've already written beta there, so over n, make these parentheses more symmetric, times the manifold vector for the look direction, v0. Right, so now I'm going to uh, distribute this v0 through and reorganize the terms a little bit. Uh, and, and let me show you what we get when we do that. So if I do that, I get the, uh, I'm just going to put this down in the denominator. v0 times i gives me v0. Uh, v0 times this term here, I get v1 Hermitian v0 which is just a scalar now, right? That's the inner product of these two vectors. I'm going to group that with the n. So I now have beta, which is a gain term, this term, which is a constant or, or is a gain term, and then the, ve the vector v1. And I'm going to do one more thing, which is I want to, I want to divide both this v0 and this v1 by n. So I'm going to move another n out in front to let me do that. And, and my, my sneaky ulterior motive for doing that is that I want to make these things both look like conventional beamformers for the look directions of V0 and V1. So let me, uh, again, I'm going to sort of you know, foreshadow what's going to go on here. I'm going to put both of these over N and then put the N up here to balance it out. So let me, now that I've done that messily, let me uh, do it quickly and neatly on the ne next line. So when I, I think about what's going on here, I have a gain term out front uh, that it, then uh, I have this term here. Well, this is the CBF for my look direction. Right? This is saying if it wasn't for the pesky interferer, I would just be using this this thing, this this CBF. But I can't. I'm going to do. I'm going to take that and then I'm going to subtract off. Well, a couple of constant gain terms here. And then this thing would be the CBF for the interferer direction. Right, so it's like I've taken the CBF for the interferer direction. I'm scaling it by something here that is a, uh, a is like the beam pattern for the, if I were looking in the interferer direction, what would be the beam pattern in the look direction when I had steered to the interferer? So this CBF, and then I've got this other gain term here, this beta that was my temporary variable earlier that depends on the number of sensors and how loud the interferer is compared to the background noise. Well, whenever I see a sum or a difference of two things, I should think about parallel branches, right? If I'm going to draw a block diagram, I'll have this in parallel branches. So let me uh, let me stop the video and I'll I'll show you the 
the block diagram on the next page. So at the top level, I'm going to have some data vector x that goes through my beamformer w naught and comes out y. And just to be consistent, cause I'll, I'll use the blocks rectangles like this to indicate uh, beamforming operations, as opposed to I'll use triangles to show things that are just scaling by a constant, or gain terms. Uh, and so I'm going to now say let's draw an equivalent by plugging these terms in. And I'm going to be a little clever about the order. I'm going to save this gain out in front to the very end because it applies to both of these terms. So let me show you how that works out. So the first thing for each of these branches, I'm going to identify these CBFs. So I have the, when I took the Hermitian of this thing, I have a V naught Hermitian N. This is the CBF for the desired look direction. And this is the CBS for, for the interferer direction. It's important to remember, it's not like I've gone and explicitly located the interferer. Remember where this term came from was just the matrix inverse. The math in the matrix inverse is just out, sort of automatically pulling this out if I have a single interferer that's there. It's not like I had to go build one, find where the interferer was like I normally would and, and do this. This just, I got this for free out of the, the Capon formula, the optimal formula. And so now I, I've got the sort of matrix part or the, the beam for, two beam forming parts, but now I need to have some gains on them before I put them together and afterwards. So let me fill in those gain terms. So I've got this output from the V1 part from the interferer beam. I scale it by beta, and then I scale it by the conjugate of this term, which becomes V0 Hermitian V1 over N. And then I'm going to subtract those two. So I say I have a, I bring these two back together. subtracting the bottom branch. So all this stuff related to the interferer direction that I just get for free out of the matrix inverse, essentially, I'm, I'm subtracting off from the top one. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scoot over to give myself a little more room. I have one more gain block, which is the alpha n over sigma n squared. So I take both of those, and this will be my output. And so this is where we get, the, in fact, this layout, this kind of block diagram should look kind of familiar to things you saw earlier and that we saw earlier with null steering. This idea of I have a CBF in the look direction minus something in the direction I want the null. So without me explicitly making a null steering constraint, I have effectively got to something like it, but with this extra gain term here, right? We saw. Uh, earlier, that in, in the null steering version, that I had something like this with a CBF minus another branch, uh, and and this whole form is called the generalized side lobe canceller. And so this is a, a very, very useful way to think about what's going on in an adaptive beamformer. That is, uh, and and can be a way. You can't really implement it like this because because you're just sort of getting this for free inside the matrix inverse. But conceptually, it helps us to think about it this way, saying, oh, what it's doing is like taking what I would have had from the CBF, also taking for any direct and direction, taking some the interferer direction, estimating the signal from that direction, scaling it by beta. Well, this beta, if you look at it, if you've seen estimation theory, this is the Wiener filter gain or the Wiener gain for the interferer direction. So what that tells me is I'm finding the minimum mean square to error estimate of the amplitude of the signal coming from, from the interferer direction, which if the interferer is loud will be a pretty good estimate. And then this term here, because of the conjugate, I can think of this now is like the beam pattern in the, the look direction evaluated in the interferer direction. Right, so it's like saying I figure I'm, I take this branch here to do my minimum mean squared error estimate of what the signal is coming from the interferer direction. I'm going to scale it by the beam pattern that's telling me how much of that would be crosstalk into my look direction, and subtract it out of what I found from the look direction, saying, well, this has uh, the stuff I want plus a whole bunch of interfering stuff, and this bottom branch is my best estimate of that interfering stuff. I'm going to subtract out. And then this is the scaling essentially for the unity gain at the end, that this can be simplified with some algebra. But conceptually, it's not important. What is important is I take my best estimate of what's coming from the interferer direction. This, the first two blocks are my best estimate. I scale it by the gain based on the side lobe I'm going to have in the interferer direction when I'm looking in the V naught direction. 
and take all that and subtract it off what I got from the V-naught direction to get my beamformer in that direction. So that's a really useful, powerful result. I mean, maybe making this beam pattern thing a little clearer here, right? What's going on around here is we're saying, I've got some beam pattern like this. When it's steered in the U-naught direction, right? For, so, so they're steered in the look direction for U-naught. This is my, my desired direction in the top branch. I'm saying this point, this, this gain here, this is the B that I would be seeing in the interferer direction. So how much of the interferer, power of the interferer, that I, or how much of this interferer signal here I expected to be scaled by the side lobe and then subtract off what that was. Right, so this is a, a, a very helpful, useful interpretation. A couple other comments, although we've done it for the single interferer case, you can do it for more and more interferers and, and have more and more linear algebra to get through, but not really any more conceptual ideas. Each, in, each interferer, We'll give you another branch like this with possibly another gain that has to do not only with the crosstalk to the top branch, but how much, uh, how much crosstalk you already have with the existing branches if they're not orthogonal. So if the interferers are not all orthogonal to each other, you'll have a little bit to say, well, you know, I already subtracted a little bit of crosstalk from that in the earlier branches. A lot of algebra, not a lot of ideas. Same basic idea is take the CBF in the look direction and, and you can interpret what the optimal MBDR beamformer is doing is making these distinct estimates for each interferer that appears in S and, and, and subtracting it off before I get to the final output. Okay, so that's the generalized side lobe interpretation of MBDR. Again, not a way we necessarily build these things, but it lets us make connections saying, well, if beta goes to one, I can show what's going on here is essentially what I already had in my CBF to, or in my null steering to begin with. So at, at one extreme, when beta goes to one, this acts like the, uh, the null steering case I already know about. At the other extreme, if beta went to zero, well, this whole bottom branch just gets turned off, right? I have a gain of zero here, and I'm back to a CBF. And so that's kind of reasonable as well. So, it, so there's, there's nice behavior at either extreme of the two. And so the generalized side lobe canceller turns out to be an important way to interpret what's going on inside that matrix inverse inside the MVDR beamform. So I've said enough about that. I'll stop now. Uh, and we'll pick up the discussion in class tomorrow with some more examples of thinking about how MBDR behaves. Okay, let's see, see you next time.